So look with me in Ephesians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, 11 says, speaking of Jesus, it says, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Can I pause there? Just leave that verse up there if you don't mind. The reason why we know that the gifts of the Spirit and fivefold ministry has not ended is that phrase right there tells you. How long does it last? Until we all, all Christians, attain to the unity of the faith. Do you think that's happened? And to the full knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You look around, does anybody want to say, I have achieved, along with everybody around me, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? No, we know we haven't achieved that yet. That's why we still need fivefold, because that's the reason they're given. Okay? Verse 14 So that we no longer may be children. That means immature in the faith, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. You're just going to pause there. Um, there are some crafty people that call themselves leaders, fivefold leaders. They talk well, they know all the lingo, they have Bible knowledge. And they're nothing more than plants in the church, planted by the enemy to bring in craftiness for a purpose that will expose later. Be watchful. You'll see more of that as we get closer to the end of the age. By craftiness and deceitful schemes. Instead of all that, rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way. Everybody say, grow up. Grow up. In every way into him, into Jesus who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, that's actually a very theological passage of scripture, and I'm just doing an overview today. And, and mainly, I'm going to approach this like maybe, I'm just going to pretend none of us have ever really explored fivefold ministry before, fivefold leadership before. And I guarantee you, every time I study it, the Lord, and I've been studying it for years and years, and I've been working to bring it as much as I can with my influence to bring it back into the foray of how we do ministry, because these are Bible blueprints. We, we, you live in a day, most of you were raised in a church that, who was, who was the primary person? What do they call that person? Pastor. The pastor is the guy. And what's interesting is the word pastor is the least mentioned office in all of the New Testament. I think it's two or three times the word pastor is used. You're going to find prophets, you're going to find teachers, you're going to find apostles, you're going to find evangelists more than you find pastors. But pastor is the word that is all encompassing. And so in the dynamic of the American church in the last probably 150, 200 years, one guy, and it's almost always a guy, one guy is supposed to do everything and lead in everything equally in gifting skill and ability. So as a pastor, he's supposed to be the tender caretaker of the flock, meeting needs, doing the visitations, loving on them, marrying, burying, counseling, all the stuff that pastors do, all valid stuff. But while he's doing that, he's also supposed to be winning the community to Christ. So the pastor is now juggling the evangelist. So he's only got two. He's just juggling two pens right now. That's okay. We, we can handle that. Throw one behind the back. He's getting good at it and everything. And then all of a sudden, he needs to discern the word of the Lord. What is the spirit saying? Because the pastor, who's functioning as the evangelist, also better have the prophetic flow of what the Lord is saying right now. So a third pen gets introduced, and now he's sweating bullets. And on top of all that, he better bring a solid biblical message every time we get together. We want exposition. I want to know the book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 16. I want to know the Greek. I want to know all of the verb tenses. I want to know the historicity of the Bible and the context. And so now this one guy has got all these plates spinning and then somebody says what's the vision of the church what are we doing he's like I don't know I can't get my head up from under the water of all this other stuff but he's supposed to be apostolic too the vision the mandate mobilizing building teams that's the church you grew up in is it any wonder the average tenure of a new pastor in an American church is two and a half years <laughs> then they go sell cars because <laughs> it's easier the reason why you're sometimes frustrated with that person you've called pastor is because the way you're wired is the way you think he or she is supposed to be ministering. He's not evangelistic enough. 
She doesn't teach enough. There's no vision. All we do is get together and pray. And we never go out soul winning. And if that man was a man of God, he'd be knocking on doors every Tuesday night because bless God, that's what we do to win the loss to Jesus. And we all have this, this in, internal expectation of the person leading the church. That's why God never gave it to one person. It's supposed to be it, like the five offices are to work together to, in order to bring about the purpose of God in his church. So let's go over these in the remainder of our time today, okay? I'm going to give you two points. Well, let me give you three. Here's the first one. Jesus gifts leaders to the church. This sounds really sappy coming from the guy who's standing in a leadership position, but leaders are a gift to every local assembly and they're a gift to the church at large. The Bible says that Jesus gave the apostles. He gave the prophets. He gave the evangelists. He gave the shepherds and teachers. Okay, prior in the beginning of Ephesians chapter four, Paul is saying we need the unity of the spirit. We need the people of God to remain focused on the big picture. We need to be unified in the Lord where there's one Lord, one church, one baptism, one faith. We need to stay in our unity. And then it talks about how the Lord purchased everything from us, left heaven, came to earth, died, rose again, led captivity captive. And as Jesus went back to heaven, what did he do? He's like, well, my mission's got to continue. So I'm going to leave leaders in my place. I'm going to make sure that there are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelists, there are shepherds or pastors and teachers. So when we think of leaders in the church, and yes, we all know that there's some fakes, there's some counterfeits, there's some self-appointed, mama called people that occupy spaces of leadership, but the, that you never let the abuse of a truth undermine the validity of that truth. Every truth is abused. If you throw away every truth that's abused, you're going to be empty handed. And so, yeah, there are leadership abuses. That's not what we're discussing today. We're talking about the real deal. And that Jesus gives leaders to churches. Your leaders here in this house are gifts from God to you for your good. And so what, what are these five? I'm just going to go over very, and then each week, Lord willing, we're going to break down one of the five. So today for overview, what are apostles? I call them advancing leaders. They're advancing leaders. What do apostolic leaders or apostles do? They are all about order. They take chaos and bring it into symmetry. They walk into a situation where there's no function, there's no form, there's no intentionality, there's no rhythm that's established, there's lack of clarity, or maybe there's nothing at all. There's just nothing there. And an apostolic leader will bring order. An apostolic leader will eventually build teams of other leaders. He'll, he or she will identify and release other leaders, build teams with them. And typically, the apostolic leader lives and ministers with a fair amount of spiritual gravity. That means they're, they're, they're often not the, the friendliest person. They're probably not a person that's going to sit down regularly with you and go to lunch and talk about life and, you know, be at your kid's grave graduation. And we love that stuff. That stuff's important, but it's typically not an apostolic leader that's going to do that. When you look in Acts chapter number six and the original leaders there in Acts chapter six, they were being bombarded with the, the, the have tos of ministry. And it got to the point where they called a gathering and the, the apostle said, we can't do all of this pastoral work. God has our primary targets as what were the two things they were supposed to do. Anybody know? Stay in the word and pray. Now, a lot of people think, well, I'd like that job description. That sounds awesome. But I'm telling you, it's unto something. They are responsible. And when there's much authority given, there's a whole lot of accountability given too. They're going to give a stricter answer to the Lord. And so it was incumbent upon them to hear the voice of the Lord so that they could advance. And so an apostle will live with the idea when he looks at the flock, this is what he, he or she is wondering. What is your part in the mission of God for your generation? That's what apostolic people want to know. Hey, where are you in the midst of all that God is doing? Have you found your place? Do you know what God's purpose is for you? You haven't? Good. I'm going to bring you into it. We're going to train you. We're going to equip you. And we're going to release you. And you're going to be part of a team. And then they do it over and over and over. They're builders, okay? Well, then you have prophets. 
Whereas apostles are advancing leaders, they're primarily about the mission of God, prophets are revelatory leaders. When you get around prophetic people, especially in the office of prophet, a leader in the church that carries the office of prophet, they're consumed with two primary things. What is God saying right now and what is God doing right now? That's what they want to know. Some of you, as I'm saying this, you're like, yeah, that's exactly what everybody needs to be thinking. Well, that's because you're a prophetic person. And it's not what it, that God hasn't, listen, if you go back up in Ephesians 4 prior to the verses I read, you're going to find an interesting phrase. It says that Jesus gave a measure of grace for these callings. In other words, most apostolic people won't have the pastoral grace. It's not because they're insufficient or negligent in their duty. It's because God didn't give them the grace to be pastoral. Pastoral people only want to be with the flock primarily. They just want to take care of people. We'll get that in a minute. That's why they feel like smothered. Most pastors that are true pastors, when they've got people in their church saying, what are we doing? What's the plan? What's the vision? Where are we going? What's next? Those pastors are like, I don't know. Well, you should know you're the man in charge. And what, what most of them don't have vocabulary for is this. God actually hasn't given me apostolic grace to answer those questions. And so when we're looking at this, the prophetic grace is saying we need to hear the Lord. It doesn't matter who else is talking. We've got to get what God is saying and we need to add our yes and amen to it. Prophets don't like a whole lot of chatter. They don't like a whole lot of like unnecessary stuff. Matter of fact, a lot of prophetic people and true prophets, they spend a lot of time alone with the Lord. They got to hear the voice of the Lord and when God releases them, they'll come out of that place and they'll say, here's what the Lord is saying. If you're a prophetic person, you're probably misunderstood by most of the people in your life. You feel like the weirdo. And they'll tell you you're weird because you don't get all caught up in the stuff that doesn't matter. You're just saying, oh, can we just get quiet and hear Jesus, what the Holy Spirit is saying? It's because that's the grace on their life. We need them, by the way. Every apostle needs a prophet or two at his or her right hand. Um, we'll talk about that later on in one of the other messages. Evangelists, you guys are har harvesting leaders. I love evangelists. Scott, where's Scott? Scott, you in here anywhere? There's Scott back there. Stand up real quick. Go ahead. Scott Stevens is probably out of the maybe one of two guys I've ever met in my life. He has almost nothing else in his blood but evangelism. He is carrying the office of evangelist. I will say that without hesitation in this house. He carries the office of evangelist in this house. And this is what evangelists, sure. He'll tell you very quickly, I didn't sign up for it. The Lord just gave me the grace. All Scott wants to do when he's in our leadership meetings, I'm going to tell you, he's like, and when we're talking for an hour and a half about stuff and everything, and Scott's just like, yeah, if I need to vote, I'll vote because I don't care about any of this stuff. Can I go? Can I go? Because there are people out there dying without Jesus and we need to get the gospel to them. I love that about him. An evangelist has really one question for people here she meets. Are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? And then they have a second question for the body of Christ. Will you help me reach the lost? To the unsaved, they're like, where are you headed, heaven or hell? To the saved, they're like, are you going to help us reach the lost? You're not going to help me reach the lost? Okay, you go over there and prophesy in your closet. You go over there and make a hospital visit, Pastor. Apostle, you go ahead and chart the vision. And the teacher, you go ahead and parse the Hebrew. You do your thing. Anybody want to go out and help me win people to Jesus? That's what the evangelist bleeds. That's their harvesting leaders, okay? Shepherds are the caring leaders, Shepherds are those who, who, who literally, they have this grace on their life. And when they see people, this is what they feel. I want to know you. I want to help you. I want to I walk alongside of you. I see your struggle. I want you to know I am here. How are you? And how can I help you? The, the, the pastor shepherd doesn't really care about having a prophetic word. The pastor shepherd is not really primarily interested. Some of these can overlap, by the way. You're not necessarily just this or this. They, there is some overlap with a lot of people. But the office of a pastor is not really wanting to go out and cold knock on a door and share the gospel with somebody. A lot of them would be petrified to do that. Be like, Scott, you went into Jesus, bring him to me when they get saved. Why? Because the pastor says, I want to walk this out with you. 
I want to help you. You're grieving. You're hurting. You're misunderstood. You're, you're kind of aimless right now. I hadn't seen you in a long time. Hey, where have you been? I haven't seen you at church in a long time. You're sick. How can we help? And by the way, I want to tell you, I believe that there are dozens and dozens of people in this church that, that at least have pastoral shepherding gifting. Some of you are actually fivefold pastors. We, we connect pastor with the person in the pulpit. Can I, Paul Johnson said this, so he broke the ice, and I think I've said, I am not a pastor. I'm not. You can get all mad and jacked up and all bent and un just unclench and just realize you don't want me trying to use a gift and a grace that I've never been given. And I spent the first 15 years of my ministry bowing to that pressure. And I know how to do all the pastoral stuff. I can walk into a hospital just like you can. You're sick in the hospital. I walk in. I'm like, are you sick again? <laughs> Let me lay my hands on you. Let's get up on out of here. Come on. You know, that, that's just my gifting. I got time? No, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. First time I ever went on a hospital visit, I was a junior staff member at Meadow Baptist Church. It was 1995. And they made the mistake of sending me as a rookie on a hospital visit with the assistant pastor. And we walk in and his name was Mike. And Mike says, don't say a word. Just watch. I'm going to show you how to do pastoral visits. And I said, oh, okay. So I went into the hospital. I'm standing there with Mike, person sick. And I'm just like, oh, man, this is a matter of fact. I'll just tell you, she ended up dying. That's what happens when I walk into the hospital room, apparently. But, <laughs> but she didn't die right then and there, but she did die later. But, so Mike does all that. He, he was so good at pastoring and shepherding. It was very comforting and everything. But he made a tactical mistake. He had me close in prayer. <laughs> Here's how I opened my prayer. Let's just call her Mrs. Smith. So Mike, Mike's like, Jeff, why don't you just pray over Miss Smith and we're going to let her go. We're going we're gonna to go. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't even tell the story. <laughs> this is how I opened the prayer. I said, oh, okay, Mike, okay. Let's bow our heads. Father, I don't know if Mrs. Smith is going to live or die. <laughs> I don't remember anything after that. <laughs> when we walked out of the hospital, I was on the left, and I, I, I didn't know I did anything terrible. And I felt like Mike's eyes burning a hole in my neck. <laughs> and he was like, what are you doing? That's not, I'm just thinking, you asked me to use a gift I clearly don't have. Now, can you adopt and, and grow in those things? Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is I know how to do pastoral work, but that's not the grace that's on my life. Pastors are essential. They're essential. Apostolic leaders will make it all about the mission and people will die on the journey. Pastors make sure they don't. Some of you in, in upcoming months will step into a pastoral role and call here. We will probably call you pastor. It's not about the title, but it is about understanding the grace that's on your life, the gift that's on your life, and releasing you to be a part of what God is doing in this house. Uh, so shepherds are the caring leaders, evangelists are the harvesting leaders, prophets are the revelatory leaders, um, apostles are the advancing leaders, and the teachers are the instructional leaders. This is what true teachers want to do. Teachers are looking at people and they're thinking, do you know what is eternally true? You live in a world of lies. You're bombarded with lies all day, every day. Wherever you go, the devil's lying to you. The world is lying to you. People that are deceived are lying to you. Do you know what is true? What is your relationship to your Bible? That's what a teacher wants to know. What is your current relationship with the written word of God? The prophet's going to be, what is God saying? And the teacher will typically say, what has God written? They're both valid. Because, by the way, those two voices will never conflict. What he's saying will never conflict with what he's written. If it does, you better trust what is written because somebody has misinterpreted what he's saying. And so if you don't know what's true, the teacher says, little else matters. What does it matter how sincere you are if you're sincerely moving in the wrong direction? What does it matter if you're zealous when you are fiery, leaving a blazing fire in the wrong direction? What does it matter that you're loving if you're loving people into deception? So the teachers keep us grounded and anchored. And teachers in the fivefold, they... They understand God's word, they understand God's works, and they understand God's ways, and they help us to do the same, okay? So we need all of these. There's not one that's better than the other. There's not one that is more important than the other. Why? Because they're all God's idea. 
And he's not schizophrenic. He doesn't have like these disjointed thoughts about what's right and what's wrong. All of these are valid. But the church for 150 years has been so stinking lazy that we're just like, hire somebody that can do most of it and we'll live with what can't be done. And there's not a single person on earth that's supposed to carry the weight of all five of these offices, not in full functionality, okay? All right, so let me give you verses 12 and 13. Why do we need these leaders? Because they provide advance to the church. Let, let me give you an illustration. Matter of fact, I'll give you a, a story. July 17th last year in Las Vegas, an airplane, it was a Delta flight, 555, Delta 555 was leaving Las Vegas and it was coming to Atlanta. And the plane had a problem with some of the components of it. And for four hours, all of the people are on the plane. All of the passengers, four hours, stuck on the tarmac, not running, cabin temperature hits 111 degrees. I, I remember being stuck on a runway for about 15 minutes, and I'm twitching, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm, four hours, they're all on the plane. How many of you know the purpose of a plane is to get you from where you are to where you need to be? Now look, the plane had mechanics, they were figuring out what was wrong. They had flight attendants, they're taking care of the people. They had obviously a pilot, a co-pilot. Somebody sold the ticket to get on the plane, but the plane wasn't fulfilling its purpose. Why? Because it's stuck on the tarmac for four hours. By the way, the people went bananas. You know, anybody can maintain, you know how it is, like when you're stuck somewhere, you're fine for about 10 minutes and then the person you're sitting next to is chewing their gum too loud. <laughs> you know, somebody didn't wear deodorant that day. I almost said something even worse than that, but I'm not going to, but my point being is, is when the plane is on the ground, nobody's happy. I want you to think of the five-fold office in a similar dynamic. The evangelist gets you the ticket. The evangelist isn't even in the plane. The evangelist is at the ticket counter making sure you get on the plane to go where you need to go. The teacher is the one that knows how everything works in the plane. That is the mechanic. The mechanic knows the components, the systems, the wirings, the gear. That is representative of the teacher that knows how everything is put together. The flight attendants, who are they? The pastors. Could I help you today? How can I make your flight more enjoyable? You seem to need um, a pillow. Could I offer you a beverage? They're taking care of the people. I think the prophet in this paradigm of the airplane has a twofold role. I think the prophet is the co-pilot. And I think the prophet is the federal air marshal. The prophet that sits back. Prophets are like this. They walk around and they're like, where's the devil? Where is the devil? I'm going to stomp me a demon. I know the devil. I can feel him in the plane. I can feel him in the room. We're going to crush the serpent's head. So the, the prophet has a dual role to protect the flock or the passengers and to help the apostle who's the pilot. The apostle, look, what good is a beautiful plane with all of the refreshments, perfect mechanics, if there's nobody to fly it? And that's what the apostle does. The apostle, you don't want the apostle doing the flight attendant's job. I'm not going to feel awesome if I'm 10,000 feet in the air and the, the, the pilot is pushing the little cart. Soda, coffee, tea? <laughs> Can I get you a graham cracker, an adult beverage? No, I don't, I don't want any. I want to know that the person that's qualified to fly the plane is in the cockpit. Amen. With a co-pilot to get me where I need to be. A lot of churches are sitting on the tarmac. They're sitting there. Everybody's in their seat. The thing's put together right. You got plenty of stuff going up and down the aisles. The pilot's in the cockpit, but the engines aren't running. And guys, what we're finding out is in the day that we're living, we have got to get the plane off the runway to go to the place where God has called us. Antioch Outpost is not interested in having the leadership at Antioch Outpost. We're not interested in having cool services. We're not interested in making sure that, you know, everybody just shows up, pay your ticket fare. Pay it online. Pay it in the black boxes on the outside of the walls. Pay it when we pass the button. No, 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 no. That's not what we're about. 
we're realizing God has put us all on this thing called Antioch Outpost because he wants to take us somewhere. And there's plenty of room to bring others on. But I don't want the flight attendant in the cockpit. Uh, I, I don't want the mechanic being the federal air marshal. And I don't want the, the evangelist, I don't want the person selling tickets to be pushing the carts. I want everybody finding their place in that illustration so that we can do what we're called to do together with the graces that are upon our life so that we end up landing where the Lord wants us to land, okay? So let me give you this and I'm gonna let you go. This won't take long. Um, in this concept of landing the plane and flying the plane and advancing and going to the de destination, um, in verse number 12, the reason why we're told that we have five-fold leaders back out of the plane and into the church, here we go, is to equip the saints. Leaders aren't supposed to do all the work. If they are, they're terrible kingdom leaders. Leaders are supposed to participate in the work, but they're not supposed to do it all. What are they supposed to do? Primary, this is Bible blueprint. You know, this is not my idea. The Bible says that the five-fold leadership paradigm that was God's idea that Jesus released to the church is given in order to equip the saints. Good morning, saints. You saved by the blood of Jesus? Where were you born, Effa? Okay, this is Saint Effa from New Jersey. I'm Saint Jeff from Miami. You're a saint. All the saints of God are to be equipped for the ministry. That's what it says in the next phrase. What are we being equipped for? By our leaders, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Every Christian is to serve. It's a foreign concept. It's not about guilt. It's not about legalism. It's not about striving. It's not about the spirit of religion. Every Christian is to serve the king. Every single one of us. And it is incumbent upon five-fold leaders to work together within the church to provide a format for Christian saints to be equipped for the working up of, for the working of the ministry that ends up building up the body of Christ. This will blow some of you away, especially Scott and those that are evangelistic. The primary thrust of the church is to build up the church to carry out the work of the ministry. And so, and I know you know that, Scott, I'm not picking on you, but, but like literally the, the number one, we say we, the Great Commission, it's all about the Great Commission. That is true. Great Commission begins with evangelism, but doesn't terminate with evangelism. It's to make disciples. How do we make disciples? Equipping and teaching and advancing and hearing the voice of the Lord. How long does it go on? I mentioned this earlier, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Just very quickly, this hasn't happened yet. So we are to be equipping you. You are to be consistently growing and you're equipping for the work of ministry. This is, man, it's quiet in here. Is this new or are y'all just saying, leave us alone? <laughs> like this is God's will for the church. And we are to do it until we attain to the unity of the faith. Now, listen, there can be unity of the faith in a local congregation, but he wasn't particularly talking about just a local congregation. What he is saying here is, is unpacked a little bit further next. It's like the five-fold paradigm will be the blueprint of the church until Jesus comes back. And the American church and most churches in the world have replaced it with our own ideas, with CEO business models that, by the way, produce a lot of results. But does it bring pleasure to the one who died in order to gift the church with the leaders that he expects to, to do the work of the training and the building up of the body of Christ? Um, this will go on until the unity of the faith, until the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Some of you have friends that are of different denominational persuasion, and they, they, you start talking about prophets and apostles, and they'll tell you right off that, oh, no, those guys don't exist anymore. The prophets, apostles are done. It's all about evangelist shepherds, teachers now. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, why do you believe that? Well, apostles and prophets, they passed off of the scene. There were only 12 of them. Oh, the, the apostles of the Lamb. Yeah, there were 12 of those guys. What about the other, mm, about 18 prophets that are mentioned in the New, excuse me, apostles that are mentioned in the New Testament? There's at least 21 apostles mentioned in the New Testament. 
And Paul writes to the church of Corinth and speaks of apostles. And so they didn't all die out. And of course, the prophets didn't either. But a lot of people say, well, the prophets and the apostles are gone. And now all we have is evangelists and pastors. And I'm thinking, who gave you permission to remove three of the five? Or evangelists, teachers, and pastors, two of the five. Like when we start messing around with the word, this is the teacher coming out in me right now, by the way. You start taking stuff out of the Bible because you're uncomfortable with it. Well, what's next on your list that you're uncomfortable with? Holiness? Love? Giving? I mean, if we're all writing our own Bibles, we're in, we're in big trouble. And by the way, that's what's happened a lot. And so one of the things we need to do is just humble ourselves and say, God, we may not know how to do this, but you said to do it. And so that's what we call reforming the church. When we have not been doing what we should have been doing, when we have not been being who we should have been being, they're, 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 God raises up a voice of, some voices in a generation and says, we're getting back to the truth. We're going to do things God's way. What benefit does this have for us, Pastor? Okay, well, you asked, so let me tell you a verse. Uh, it says, here, here's the end result, so that we no longer may be children. Tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. That's pretty important. Can you imagine being deception proof in your heart? That's God's desire for you, to be deception proof. That because you're a part of a spiritual family or you have been in your past where you've been poured into properly, you've been matured in the Lord, you've been held accountable, you've been instructed, empowered, and at times corrected, where you are submitted to spiritual authority that God places. That is a, like, every time I mention that, you can feel the, the, like the nasty spirit and some people cringe. Don't talk to me about human authority. You better start ripping out pages in your Bible then. There's human authority in the church. And the fact that it's been abused, yes, it has been abused, doesn't mean that God changed his mind. You deal with the abuse. You don't change the doctrine. And what happens is when the church functions, here's the thing, we won't be little babies in Christ. We have a nursery here. It's probably pretty full today, pretty full this morning. Got a bunch of babies in there. There's a lot of churches in the main sanctuary. You got some people sitting in spiritual diapers, sucking on a spiritual bottle, crying because they didn't get their way, clenching their fists and turning red in their face. <laughs> sitting in their own mess. What happened? Little children? Little babies? Well, how, what's, the, what's the danger? They get tossed in to and fro by the waves. What does that mean? They don't know what's true. They don't know how, how to prophetically discern what's real and what's not. And Satan is a master deceiver. And so if it looks good and sounds good because they're children who haven't been properly raised up and trained and equipped, they're blown about by the latest wind and the coolest thing. It's going to happen more and more. Jesus prophesied that in the time before his coming, that massive waves of deception are going to dominate and people are going to fall away. I, uh, I got hit with something, was it last week? Maybe two weeks ago. Maybe this will help you. Maybe it'll cause you to lose confidence in me. I'm going to share it either way. I was just studying and I was praying and we were fasting. It was a couple of Tuesdays ago. And I felt like I just heard the Holy Spirit say to me, when was the last time you humbled yourself and asked the Lord to make sure you never are susceptible to any deception? Oh, I've got a master's of divinity, Lord. I'm in the Bible all the time. I preach four or five times a week. I shepherd, I lead, I podcast, I do all that stuff. It doesn't de deception proof you. It doesn't. And guys, I'm just going to tell you, I, I just got before the Lord, and I wasn't afraid, I wasn't doubting my salvation or anything like that, but I was humbled that like maybe we underestimate the deception that's coming. Maybe we just assume it's going to be so patently obvious that pff, I ain't worried about that. It, maybe it's going to pick off people who are casual church attenders that refuse to humble themselves and submit to spiritual leadership that was for them to lead them, to equip them, to train them. 
Guys, I'm just saying, this stuff has a benefit for us if we say yes, and it could have some pretty terrible consequences if we just go ahead with the American flow. Hey, bro, we've been doing it this way for a long time in America. It seems to be working. Really? I sound like a cynic. I'm not trying to be a cynic. I'm just saying I don't think we have a lot of time just to kind of be casual about this. Human cunning. Let me just say this. And I'm not speaking this over our home posts, but I've talked with uh, Jeff Perrine about our home posts. Like, we, we are militant about what's being taught in those things. Some of you have been in home churches before, and they're fertile ground for a person who can't have their way in a church, so they get in a home church where they're the smartest person in the room. It happens all the time. I know of a guy in a home church right now. It's bad news. Bad news. Dangerous. Not one of ours. Exhale. We, we wouldn't let that happen here. We wouldn't let it happen here. But I'm thinking to myself, that's got danger written all over it. And so why is this important? Because if you are full of the truth, full of the spirit, full of humility, trained, humble, and committed to Christ, you can deception-proof your heart as long as you don't ever just assume that you're above the possibility. Beware ye that think ye stand, lest you fall. All right, let me wrap up. I don't mean to depress you guys, but this is how serious we take this stuff. Last thing, Holy Spirit imparts maturity to the church. I'm just going to read these, okay, and then we're going to go home. Instead of being deceived by every wind of doctrine, instead of being susceptible to human cunning, cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes, it's in the Bible for a reason, so there will be people that will try to deceive you. They will look like Christians. They will sound like Christians. They will have Bible knowledge. Some of them will have Bible degrees. Some of them are teaching in seminaries right now. Um, some of them are pastoring churches and have massive ministries. Do you know why, golly, I can't get off this. Do you know why some, not all, some of your largest ministries are so large? Because they don't tell the truth. Because they tell the people what they know will get the people to come back. And they provide all sorts of stuff that just makes people feel good where they are. Now listen, I'm not into like making you feel bad, but if you never get convicted in your faith, your ears are plugged. Like, I wanna get convicted if I'm messing up. And sometimes the Lord rebukes me and if I won't listen to him, sometimes my wife will say something. If I won't listen to her, some of y'all say something. That's not bad for me. That's actually really healthy for me, and it's healthy for you. But there's just some people out there that straight up, you just, golly, help me, Jesus. Like you, 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 you almost wouldn't believe it. Like There are people that will infiltrate churches and home posts, and not home posts, but house churches. They'll infiltrate them for the very purpose of deceiving you. Then they use their authority and influence for something that benefits them. For some people, it's just like, I want to get a bunch of people to come and just sit at my feet and listen to me. Other people are like, I want to manipulate this lady's heart because I want to sleep with her. I, I, that guy looks like he's six figures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I work with him because he's got something that would really enrich me. You, we don't think that stuff happens. We read about it. We think, yeah, that's out there in Kansas City. Forgive me. I'm thinking, it could be in Barrow County. All right, enough said about that for today. Rather, instead of all that, speak in the truth and love. Like, tell the truth and love people while you're doing it. Just because it's hard and uncomfortable and challenging and convicting doesn't mean it's not love. That's the problem today. The problem's like, man, you didn't make me feel awesome about me. You don't love me. That's not love, man. We're to grow up in every way into him. We, we need to brand our church. We need to have a slogan. Here it is. Two words. Grow up! <laughs> Come down here, Calpos. Grow up! <laughs> Just kidding. That's probably not what we would do. But like, I want to grow up. Raise your hand. Stand to your feet and applaud yourself if you're fully mature in Jesus. <laughs> 
We all got to grow up, man. You should be growing. You, sh you should already have experienced some spiritual growth on January 21st of this year. But you should already be able to say, oh man, on January 1st, I was struggling over here, but here I am three weeks later. I'm feeling really happy because the Lord has helped me, okay? So we grow up into him. We grow up into Christ. He's the head. The pastor's not the head. The apostle's not the head. The prophet's not the head. The evangelist is not the head. And the teacher's not the head. They never were. I, I promise you this. I, my title is senior leader. We chose as generic and non-cool of a title as we possibly could. I'm, I'm five-star apostle, prophetic, evangelist, and teaching guru Lyle. <laughs> My business card is that wide to fill all of that out. No, man, just like, what, what do you do? Jeff? Well, my role here is to lead the leaders. That's my role, but I'm not the head of the church. Oh, believe me, I am not the head of the church. I'm not even the leader of the church. I lead leaders, but I lead with leaders. And so, guys, this is the kind of paradigm where people are like, we're addicted to knowing who's in charge. Jesus is in charge. The Lord is. It is our corporate responsibility. Just stand to your feet because otherwise I'll never stop. It's our corporate responsibility to follow his leadership. Some days I don't hear everything that needs to be heard. One of the, the staff do. Other days it's a senior leadership team member that we lead with. Highest, highest position in this church as part of the senior leadership team. And sometimes I'm not hearing it. And one of them or two of them or three of them or four of them hear it. Sometimes on Tuesday night, one of our prophetic people will say, I think this is what the Lord is saying. Can we, can we press into this? And we press into it for an hour in prayer. And over time, with multiple people standing before the head of the church, we get the will of God for the church. And we do it over and over and over again. So if you're visiting here today, that's what you've stepped into. If you, if you want a more Americanized version of church, I'm not going to throw stones at you. I want you somewhere. But I'm just, I'm, I'm just convinced I cannot lead that way anymore. It's not his will for this house. God is raising up something here. We're not the only one. We're not that special. But he is raising up something here, a group of people that will continually lay down what we have and just saying, examine it, give us back what's good, keep what isn't. We fast and we pray because there, there's not a person on our leadership teams that is convinced he or she can, can get what is needed apart from seeking the face of the Lord and waiting on the Lord. We're, we're, we're just not that gifted. We're not that awesome. But I'm going to tell you something. You put a non-gifted or a maybe, I won't say non-gifted, but you, put a, you just put a Christian in the presence of the Lord who will seek his face, listen to him, obey, even when what he says is like, ooh, but you just do that, the favor of God will rest on it. And when you get hundreds of people in an assembly, when we started at, uh, by the time we wound up prayer this morning, let's just say about 10 o'clock, um, I don't know, there's a hundred and something people in here. We're just seeking God. That's all we're doing. It, there's no band. There's no real agenda. It's just, here we are. This is your house. What do you want to do today? We're your people, Lord, and we don't want to do it without you. Even if we could, we don't want to. And so if we'll keep doing that, and over the next few weeks, I want you to listen to Holy Spirit. Some of you may have like a five-fold call on your life and a five-fold grace. You need to own it if you do. It's not pride to acknowledge the grace that God has put on your life. Others, you may say, no, God hasn't called me to be a five-fold leader, but I bend in this way. I'd like to help that five-fold shepherd at our church to shepherd the flock. I'd like to come up under Scott, our house evangelist, and I'd like to get trained to share my faith, share the gospel. I, I'd like to take Mama Jane's courses and be equipped to hear the Father's heart in the prophetic ministry here. Sandra helps with our teaching here. Every home post needs a teacher. Every home post needs a shepherding person. Every home post needs a prophetic person. And I'd love to have an apostolic person in every single home post and an evangelist that will bring people to that. Like, that's the plan. It's not glamorous. It's not cool. Nobody, we're not going to get 100,000 followers on Instagram because we're doing something super cool. I, I just, I, 
I'm not looking at getting followers. I want to be a good follower. I just want to go where he's going, okay? All right, guess what? I'm not even going to make it religious. I'm going to bless you in the name of Jesus by saying I love you. Go home. Enjoy your afternoon. We'll see you on Tuesday. God bless.